Hi, and welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. This is the weekly Q&A session. Ask us some questions in the comments. Use the hashtag Ask GMBN Tech, and we'll see what we can do to help you. Um, first comment is, which would be better, larger rotors or upgraded brake pads for a heavier rider? And is bigger always better? Have you got recommendations for discs and pad combos? Um, okay, so this is there's a few things to this. Right, so I'm gonna use a cross-country bike for an example here. Bigger is not better because of the fact that the wheels are very light, the bike is very light. So regardless of the rider weight on there, you've got a bike that's extremely light, which means very powerful brakes. You're gonna lock those wheels up very easily. A locked up wheel is not doing anything, you're out of control. So therefore, much bigger brakes and much more powerful brakes on the light bike are kind of pointless. Um, you could arguably have a slightly bigger disc rotor, but you wouldn't want to go as far as having, say, a four-pot brake on a bike like that. Um, on my cross-country bike, I've got a 140 rotor on the rear and a 160 on the front. And actually, uh, that's fine for me. I'm about 200 pounds, give or take, uh, 92 kilos, something like that, 93 kilos. Um, so someone correct me down there, sorry. Just going with that, it's, it's about there. Um, and it's fine. So the only time I ever have problems with the brakes on the cross-country bike are if I'm running, riding something quite steep where I need a bit more braking power, I can find I just can't slow down quite enough. However, it's a fine line between that and just locking the wheels up and being out of control. So on a bike like that, yes, you can have too much braking power. Now, with regards to a trail bike or a bike that's got a bit more capability to slow it down, then yes, you're gonna need, especially if you're heavier, a bit more braking power. And there's a few ways of doing this. Now, if you were to just put larger rotors on there, yeah, you're instantly gonna get more power. But if you've got lightweight brake calipers, two piston designs, for example, you can phase them out a bit. They can get a bit hot and then you start getting brake fade and things like that because the disc rotors get hot and you get inconsistent braking. So in that case, you kind of want a combination of things. So slightly bigger rotors will definitely help but it's all gotta be about relation how you use this. So a good example would be my new proof reactor ST. That came with, uh, in fact, I've not changed the rotor sizes, but I upgraded the front brake caliper, just the caliper. So I've got, that's got Shimano XT brakes and it came with single uh, two piston brakes, front and rear. I swapped out the front caliper for a four piston one, uh, just to give myself that little bit more braking power because the rear end on it, you know, let's face it, would not much travel on there, 125 mil. It's pretty easy to lock that up with the 180 rotor that's on there. So I didn't really need that much more power. Perhaps I would if I was going abroad or something, but I think it's fine for this country. Slightly big cap on the front just deals with how much load goes through the front end of the bike with my body weight. So a few things to take into account there. So yeah, you can put bigger rotors on, but bear in mind that on a lighter bike, you're gonna lock up all the time. And on a heavier bike, you might heat up those brake calipers too much. In an ideal world, you wanna do a combination of things. Now, as far as the actual pads go, depends on your conditions and what you're doing. Metal sintered pads are gonna cope with heat very well, wet conditions very well, but they can be very loud. Uh, they can be noisy as well when in the terms of squealing and stuff, in terms of uh, riding in damp conditions, things like that. Whereas organic and resin pads, they can be very quiet, very powerful, but they can heat up too much. So there's kind of a mixture of things at play here. As far as brands go, really you won't go far wrong from the manufacturer's brands, uh, the manufacturer's own brand products, but if you want to save money on them, there are a number of cool ones out on the market. Um, Uber, brake pads, Aztec, Fibrax, there's loads of good stuff available on the market. In fact, everyone in the comments who uses alternative brake pads and rotors, let us know what you're using and what you're loving and what works for you, uh, because we would like to save a bit of cash here and there. It'd be good to know what you're running. Next one's from David. Can I put a 12-speed chain on an 11-speed drivetrain? If yes, what are some pros and cons of a system like this? I buy everything used and I can't find an affordable 12, uh, 11-speed chain. Okay, so technically yes, because the inside sizing of the chain will be the same. It's the external that's different. So for this reason, you couldn't use the other way around. You couldn't put a, um, an 11-speed chain on a 12-speed system because it'd be, you simply wouldn't be able to get the gears because the chain would be fouling on the sprocket teeth. So yes, you can use a 12-speed chain on 11-speed. I've not done this though, so I, this is theory. It will work on there because of the fact it's gonna clear everything. However, well, first, first thing, it will be extremely quiet on there. Second thing, if you're running in muddy conditions, you've got a bit more clearance for the mud, so it technically should work better in mud. So that alone means I'm interested in trying it. 
However, there could be a downside because of the fact the 12 speed chains are so precisely manufactured, they've got little chamfered edges on the front to uh, help them pass by the sprockets without catching on them and stuff. The fact that the sprockets are effectively a tiny bit further apart on your 11 speed, it might mean you get neg like a negative side to the shifting because they might not be close enough to pick up on those gates and those angled and profiled teeth to jump up to the next sprocket. So yes, it will work on there, but I don't know how well the shifting will work. Has anyone out there used a 12 speed chain on 11 speed? Um, I need to try this. I feel bad that I haven't tried it. I'm gonna try it, um, and I, but I'd like to know if anyone has tried it because it's a good way, out, arguably, of saving a bit of cash as well. Um, yeah, let us know in the comments, but technically, on a bit of paper, yes, it should work. Okay, next question is from Robert Sarosi. What's so special about the Grip 2 damper from Fox? And also, what's this super boost we've been seeing lately? Okay, so that Grip 2 damper, I mean, really, that thing works unbelievably well. So, that damper has four-way adjustment as far as damping control goes. That means it has high and low speed compression, high and low speed rebound. Now, one of the especially cool things on this particular damper is on the rebound damper, it has a variable valve control on the high speed rebound. Now, arguably, high speed rebound is one of the most important settings you can have on a damper because this will ultimately control part of your ride height. Now, if a fork or a shock can't extend quick enough, you're going to be below your, you're going to be further into the sag point than if the fork or the shock can return between hits. Um, now, this system allows it to return much faster but still have the correct rate of damping control. Um, unless you'd ridden it side by side against the previous one, you wouldn't realize how much of a difference it actually makes. Uh, it's quite huge. And to a degree, actually, this new Grip 2 damper, I'm running quite a lot of damping on it, whereas previous models, with the compression in particular, I ran them completely wide open. So because of this new design and the damper itself, arguably, I would say it's fair to say that no matter what your rider weight, you're gonna get the same consistent damping control. So I was running fully wide open compression damping, being a 200 pound rider um, on the previous model. So what does that say for someone who weighs 120 pounds? Does that mean the compression is gonna feel especially harsh for them? Uh, so this new damper is much more refined. Now it's also got a, a coil spring above the IFP, so that's the internal floating piston, um, which firstly, that makes it much more supple, much more consistent in the way that it works. But also there's like a little, I don't know how to refer to it, there's like a little teardrop shaped port um, just underneath that spring and above that IFP there. And what this allows is for oil that's got into the system um, as it actuates, or if it's overfilled, to come out of the top. So in servicing, you can overfill them, um, screw it back together essentially, actuate it, and it's gonna bleed out the, uh, the oil even that's got on the inside it doesn't need, uh, which is a cool thing, because you can feel like a hero servicing it without getting it wrong. But also, that oil, when it purges out the top, it will run down the leg itself and be cycled. So essentially it's lubricating itself as it's working, uh, ingesting the oil and purging oil back out the top. So uh, kind of quite cool. Now as for the variable valve, uh, is, is essentially, um, I'm trying to think how to describe this. The valve itself isn't just ports, it's got ports and shims and you adjust the preload on the shims to adjust the basically the rate of which it extends. So it's a very, very good system. And I would say it's, well, it's certainly the best thing that Fox have done for a long time. Um, because the fact I've got the 36, which is was on my previous reactor. Um, I've actually temporarily for the slalom race, I ended up with, I think, because I wanted a little bit slack on the front end. I've got it on, on the uh, reactor ST and I've not serviced it. I've not touched it since I had it and it still feels unbelievably smooth. Uh, absolutely fantastic performance on that fork. Really impressed with that. So super boost. Um, 157 millimeters. So we started off with 135 on the back in the quick release days. Then we went up to 142. Then we went up to boost, which is 148. And now this super boost. Super boost is the name for the trail version of this 157. But 157 is pretty common. It's what we use on downhill bikes. It's been there for a while to keep the back end wide, to keep the bracing angle of the spokes nice and wide, to allow better room for chain line. All of these things are benefits on trail bike design. But I, I'm not completely convinced that it's going to be mass market. It's going to be everywhere. Yes, it's got loads of good points to it, but arguably your rear derailleur could still be that bit further out. 
didn't have to want it that much closer to the rocks. Um, no denying, no, the fact that you can have better clearance for different suspension designs. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, the rear derailleur design is something that might move on down the line, but we always need bikes to be stiffer, the suspension to work better, to have better tire clearance, better chain lines and stuff. So uh, yeah, I guess uh, Super Boost is a good thing. Okay, next question is from Till H and it's about the RockShox Domain suspension fork. He says, uh, I can't find any videos on it, so I thought I'd ask here, how can I change the coil spring in my suspension fork? It's a Domain R coil from 2014, so the older model. I'm personally looking into getting a softer one due to the coil being too hard. Well, generically speaking, suspension forks with coil springs are fairly simple to change the spring. You literally remove the top cap. I don't know what size the nut is on there. It could be a 26 or 28 mil, perhaps, maybe even a 30 mil. Undo that, and then you get access to the spring, which you can change. I'm gonna put a couple of links in the description underneath. Um, I found one just on Amazon, and also another one on TF Tuned, which is a suspension specialist. However, both of those might not be able to ship where you're located, I don't know where you are. So uh, you can find those parts online. It's a fairly simple process to sort that out. Um, if you've got any further questions, please do get in touch, and we'll let you know what we can do about it. Uh, next one says, uh, from at P, have you ever used or worked on a RockShox silo? Um, if so, what oil would it use and can the foam rings and seals be replaced? That is a blast from the past. So when I first moved to the Bath area, 2000, 2001, I had a set of RockShox silos. I cannot remember the model for the life of me. It was gold, I remember them that much. It might have been a sort of a coppery color, I can't remember, but uh, the RockShox silo, it was a U-turn fork. You'd get coil versions and you could get uh, air spring version. Had the U-turn so you could screw the travel down and up, kind of like it was a predecessor to the Pike, really. Um, brilliant fork at the time, but um, no longer around. So yeah, you can change the foam rings and the wipers. In fact, uh, I'm gonna throw some on screen right now because I know that TF Tuned stopped those parts. Um, so if you can get them there, you can also get them at other places, but TF Tuned uh, should hopefully ship to where you are. So have a look at that. And whilst you're at it, you can get yourself some oil for them. So as far as I know, there's five weight in the damper if you wanted to do that. And it's 15 weight as the lower leg lubricant. So that's in both bottom legs there. Uh, you don't need much in, in there. I don't know the measurements to be fair. Um, if you're ordering the, the uh, seals and the foam rings from TF Tuned, if you ask them, they'll tell you the amount of oil you need for that particular fork. But yeah, you can fully service that, no problem at all, and it will feel like new. Uh, great to hear about that fork, actually. Um, like I said, there's a link at the bottom of the screen, uh, sorry, in the description underneath, so you can click that and it'll take you through to their website. And at least, if nothing else, you can understand a bit about the part, what it looks like, all that stuff. Uh, next question is from Jeff. Dolly, loving the show. Thank you very much, Jeff. Here's a question. What is the new Shimano Link Glide and what sets it apart from Hyperglide Plus? Is it something we can expect to be used on ordinary non e mountain bikes? We'd love to hear your thoughts. Okay, so being completely honest here, I haven't had my hands on it yet. Um, as far as I know, it's somewhere in transit somewhere. It's gonna be very late um, supply chain issues. Hey, it could well be on that ship that's uh, impounded in the Suez Canal. I don't actually know, uh, but I've not had it in my hands. I just know a bit about it. So to start with, you're only gonna see it on Dior and on XT levels. It's primarily designed to be much more durable, durable under bad shifting or unlucky shifting, high torque, things like that it's got a slightly different tooth profile on there. So the shifting will be smooth, probably not quite as smooth as the Hyperglide Plus, but it's designed to last much longer and be more durable. So um, I think she might say three times more durable. If that's true, that's mental. That is like a really good thing. The downside is it's 11 speed only, and like I said, XT and DL level. And I think the cassette is gonna be quite heavy as well. However, that doesn't matter. If durability is what you need, that is absolute king. Um, knowing Shimano, you know, they don't release things, you know, without sort of thinking, I mean, I have in the past, but uh, they don't tend to release things that aren't good. They tend to think about this stuff. So I reckon this has been in the pipeline for a while. Um, for the e-bike market, of course, having a cassette that's gonna handle high torque and bad shifting, or, you know, when I say bad shifting, it's shifting at bad timing, uh, under power, stuff like that. You can make a right old mess of a cassette by doing that. So uh, yeah, I've got high hopes for it. As soon as it gets here, I'll make a video with it because I'm really interested in it and I'm all for components that cost less and last a longer time. It's got to be a good thing, right? Um, so I will make that video, I promise, as soon as the stuff turns up. I honestly don't know when that'll be. Uh, could be a month or two, maybe longer. I really don't know at this stage. Um, hopefully sooner though, because I think it's going to be a really good and a popular transmission to get. Um, yeah, cool. 
Next question is from Haru McFarlane. Two spokes on my friend's bike ripped out of his alloy rim. Um, the spoke nipples are fine, but the rim is destroyed. Do you know any possible causes? Uh, I've got a press fit BB with play in it. Could this damage my frame? Okay, so the first one with the spokes sounds like potentially, um, well, Firstly, abuse will do that. And secondly, um, it could happen because the rim could have been fatigued. Uh, the rim design might not have had eyelets where the nipples come out of the rim itself. Now, eyelets are like inserts that go in there to help protect against exactly that. Potentially, the spokes that ripped out were under too much tension compared to the other side. There's a number of different reasons this can happen. Uh, it doesn't happen that often, to be fair. I haven't heard of it happening for a long time, but it can. Um, I can't say without seeing the wheel, but it's normally down to tension. If they're extremely tensioned, um, it's going to add that strain to it. And then combine that with like a hard landing or something like that, it could have gone. And again, where the spoke nipples exit the hole in the rim, if the uh, if that was fractured at all or stressed around there, it would have only taken a big impact from to rip straight out. So, uh, you know, a wheel, the whole thing about wheel, it works under tension. Um, so, well, you haven't said he's injured or not, but the rim is destroyed. So no, need a new rim. But if you're concerned about things, look for a rim that has got eyelets on there. There's enough on the market. Uh, Mavic, for example, make great rims with eyelets. Okay, next, um, what did you say? Press fit. I have a press fit BB with play in it. Could this damage my frame? I wouldn't have thought it would damage your frame, um, but to be fair, if it's got play in it, change it out because it'll end up creaking like an old wheezing donkey anyway. Um, but I guess if it was that bad and you're putting so much leverage against something with play in it, it could arguably put more strain because there's no support for the axle and stuff. So um, I'd have thought you'd need to seriously abuse a bike with a with the bottom bracket with play in it to it for it to affect the frame. But to be on the safe side, just change it. No point running something that's um, worn out and knackered like that. Do yourself a favour, yeah, just change it, mate. Um, next up from Scott Curder. Doddy, since the mullet is described as business in the front and party in the back, does that mean 27 and a half inch wheels are more fun? Just asking for a friend, and then you put in brackets, Blake. Um, all right, well, it depends on your definition of fun. Some people or some riders' definition of fun is a smaller wheel to really sort of hit little turns like that. Other riders' definition of fun might be a bigger wheel to steamroll over stuff and go twice the speed. Um, horses for courses, hey. Um, it really does depend on what you're looking for from a bike. For example, I love the way that 27 and a half inch wheels feel and I prefer 29, not because of the things I have like the stability and the fact that they can arguably roll over stuff. The thing I like is the stability I get from the bike by the bottom bracket effectively being a bit lower. So if you imagine the line between your wheel axles on 27 and a half inch wheels, the bottom bracket is fairly, fairly in line with that. You know, of course it will be dropped a little bit. But on a 29er, if you just put the bigger wheels on, you're bumping everything up. So the bottom bracket axle has to be effectively lower than your wheel axles, which is why they have this really cool stable thing. So it's not just about the wheel size, it's about the other geometry effects. And that alone, for me, is a game changer because I've got a lot of weight and it's all high up. So the heavier rider you are and the taller you are, 29ers to your benefit just purely because the fact you can get your weights as low as possible. Again, dropper posts help you do that. But like I say, you know, neither is better. They are both brilliant choices. In fact, 26 is still a great choice to riders as well. It's just gonna become a bit more limited with more modernized frames. There's nothing wrong with 26. If you've got it, there's no reason to change it. Um, it you can still get parts to replace things. Just think, you know, um, what is the expression? Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Or is it beauty is in the eye of the beer holder? I was always confused about that one because a lot of things look better when you've had a few beers, don't they? But, uh, hey, um, like I said, Beauties in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> uh, next question is from Miles McKay, or McKay. Doddy, I currently work as a commercial refrigeration and HVAC tech, but obviously bikes are way cooler than fridges. They've got six years of mechanical experience, but there aren't any bicycle mechanic training programs in my area. Any tips to make a career leap to a bike mechanic? Um, I guess work experience or doing some kind of internship type thing uh, with a bike shop or a bike brand or a distributor. There will surely be one of those options vaguely near you. Get in touch with them, make yourself known, uh, tell them what you're interested in, see if they can help. They might have vacancies, you might be able to learn something from them. 
Alternatively, enroll in one of the major online courses. Um, there's a few available. I'm going to put a link to SciTech actually down there. So SciTech is a national one here in the UK, um, and it's pretty much is in association with ACT, uh, which is I forget what it actually stands for to be honest, but all the bike dealers uh, kind of rely on it in a certification to suggest or to state basically that you've uh, you've you can mechanic to a certain level. And uh, so it's safety at the end of the day, working on people's bikes and charging money for stuff. So you want a mechanic has got that certification. So bike shops will employ you based on having certificates like that. So I would definitely read up on SciTech. And yes, it will mean you'll probably have to travel to go to one of those courses, but it's well worth it. And you get qualification out of it. So that's something that can go on your CV and it's something that's generally, uh, genuinely useful for getting a job in the bike industry. So I'd start there. Um, you can also have a look. I'm gonna throw a website link uh, on screen right now, Bicycle Industry News. There's loads of good places on there to look for jobs in the bike industry. It might give you some leads into contacts like distributors and bike brands, for example, that need help in their warehouses, warranty departments, places like that, because you can always start there and then sort of learn the skills and then migrate across into a position working with mechanics. It's fun though, get involved. It's cool that you sound like you want to. Um, good luck, let us know how you get on. In fact, I think there's probably an interesting video that we could make on the different jobs in the bike industry. I think it's more of a video over on GMBN, but there's a lot of different ways you can get into the bike industry. You know, you could be a copywriter working for a marketing company, writing stuff for magazines. You could be a journalist or a tester, uh, which was my background. You could be a photographer, you could be a videographer, you could be a creator, you could be a presenter, you could be a bike designer, you could be a bike mechanic, you could be a World Cup mechanic, you could... Actually, there's loads of stuff you could be. Uh, bike industry is a great place. But as everyone will tell you that works in the bike industry, it's a smaller place than you think. Um, so good luck and let us know how you get on. Oh, and that's, uh, that's the end of the show, actually. Uh, end of my script right there. Uh, thanks for all the great questions this week. Uh, got any questions or comments, please do get involved. Use that hashtag, Tech as always. And we'll see you in the next one. See you later.